Rabbeinu Rabbani Ka, welcome to the program. Pleasure to be here. Let me just read you President Trump's New Year's Day uh, tweet, because I want to ask your reaction on some issues. So he basically said the United States has foolishly given Pakistan more than $33 billion in aid over the last 15 years. And they've given us nothing but lies and deceit, thinking of our leaders as fools. They give safe haven to the terrorists we hunt in Afghanistan with little help. No more. So what was your reaction when you first saw that? And I guess a, a double-barreled question. Do you believe your government will retaliate by closing off routes, by closing off airspace, all the vital logistics that the U.S. needs to supply its forces in Afghanistan? My reaction to this was, what have we come to? I mean, what is the world coming to? What has the leadership of the world come to? I mean, uh, currently, like it or not, the U.S. is currently the superpower, and perhaps we are looking at a multipolar world, but currently we are far away from a multipolar world. But if you're going to tweet away our foreign diplomacy and management of our foreign policy relations, then clearly we are at a place where I would be, I would frankly, if I were sitting in the foreign office of Pakistan, I would totally ignore this tweet. I would respond to the policy statement that they gave on South Asia, which was not very encouraging for Pakistan or congratulatory for Pakistan, because that was all of government approach. Here, this is, frankly speaking, a habitual tweeter uh, who tweets rather flippantly. Uh, it's almost like which side of the bed you woke up on that day. And, uh, you know, as I said, externalizing the massive failure in Afghanistan is not a solution at all. And unfortunately, in the last many years, we've seen this earnest need on the other side. But you know, Christian, and I, I hope you would agree with me, the difference this time is that this is the president who's tweeting and a country or a, or a government which is, you know, uh, taking some action in terms of taking away the aid, which I frankly speaking think Pakistan is not really dependent on at all. I think that's exaggerated our dependence on American assistance. As somebody who's managed Pakistan's aid portfolio for almost five years while I was in government, I can tell you our reliance uh, on them is vastly exaggerated. So coming back to the response on the tweet, I, I would just say, honestly, after all the other tweets that one keeps on reading, uh, I think uh, we should be concerned about the tweeter rather than the tweet. Today, one Pakistani writer basically described the U.S. and Pakistan as locked in a monstrous pact they made during Soviet occupation of Afghanistan when they walked in with their Saudi friends carrying suitcases full of cash to give the USSR a bloody nose. Um, what do you say to that? Because it appears that you and the U.S. are locked into this paradigm. You know, I do not believe one requires to be a stable genius to do some very basic mathematics. Uh, the, the great New Year tweet that President Trump tweeted, after which there, was, there were many other interesting tweets, including calling all African countries shitholes, uh, but that's not what we're discussing right now. So, as I said, it does not take a stable genius to figure out basic mathematics. He talked about a $33 billion dollar that Pakistan received from America in terms of assistance. Now, the fact is that in the last, since 2001, Pakistan has received somewhere to the tune of $4.8 billion under the head of military assistance and somewhere to the tune of $5.3 billion in, in, in the realm of civilian assistance. And you know, I'm not one who believes that Pakistan has not had its own faults. We've had many, many faults, giving space to terrorists for pretty much in every military regime, uh, almost, has not been something that has, uh, that has uh, done Pakistan any good. I think the hug or the, um, the relationship that Pakistan and USA got into on the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was one that Pakistan was very conveniently, Pakistan and US very conveniently got out of and the loss was ours to bear because all the mujahideen which had been trained on our soil, all the infiltration of terrorist extremist mindset which had happened in our people's minds was left for us to deal with and America was happily moved away, sanctioning Pakistan and going on to more interesting adventures. Okay. You know, I'm... Let, let me just ask you, beginning did you ever think that as a former foreign minister of your very conservative mm -hmm. country, you would use that word on global television? Which is? Which well, the, the S word. Oh, of course. It's the President of the United States. He's setting new standards. I have to quote him for what he said. So, yes, as, 
as a representative of Pakistan, I have to quote the, rep the president of the United States when he chooses to use these words. And that's where we are going. That's where the world is going. So let me ask you then, because, you know, Pakistan is also very defensive and you've laid out a position as to why you're right and the, and the U.S. is wrong. But isn't it true that the Pakistan military has essentially taken control and convinced people, politicians, that permanent war is a good thing. They look at India as an existential threat rather than Afghanistan and the very hardline terrorists, uh, Taliban and the Haqqani network as being your major threat. And isn't it true that, for instance, the Taliban who's assassinated politicians, they've blown up churches and schools, they have normalized this behavior amongst Pakistanis. And the murder of school children is called a collective sacrifice. Again, this is what observers are saying. You say you've made giant leaps forward, but this is very debilitating for your country. Absolutely it is, Christian. And I am, for once, um, you know, I'm one person who truly believes that it was our effort to, together with the United States of America in ridding Afghanistan from the Soviet invasion, which instilled this extremism inside Pakistani society, it changed the fabric of the society forever and ever. But I do not believe that we are the ones to, and I do not also believe that we want to win any argument on the status of victimhood, because we do, we sacrifice what we sacrifice for the sake of our children's future, not for the sake of anybody, anyone else. You know, I believe we've been happily scapegoated for this immense failure for which Pakistan is perhaps an equal victim to Afghanistan. And I believe that we do not have the luxury, like many of our other Western friends, to be able to obfuscate facts and be flippant with the realities on the ground. You saw what happened, what is happening in Afghanistan right now. President Ghani has literally uh, take, you know, try to push out um, uh, and to accept the resignation of a Balkh governor, Atanur, who's refusing to leave. This is the type of governance structure that you have. There's warlordism all over the place. Taliban are taking control over there. Blaming each other has been happening for the last 10 years. It doesn't help. Do you think this moment is solidifying Pakistan turning away from close ties to the United States? and more towards the Chinese sphere? You know, uh, Christian, as, some, as a foreign policy practitioner, I do not agree uh, that you have to turn away from one to turn towards the other. Okay, uh, China is the regional strategic partner, perhaps the only real strategic partner Pakistan has had, not from today or the last five years, but for the last four decades. For, for them, with them, we have a complete alignment of interest. As somebody who's not a believer in conspiracy theories, I am increasingly starting to believe that the presence of the United States of America in Afghanistan is not for peace and stability. It is indeed, as George Friedman says in his book, The Next Hundred Years, to create chaos in this region so that Russia and China and many other Central Asian republics, together with Iran perhaps, can be contained. I, as I said, not a conspiracy theorist by design, by my DNA, but the more I see how we're going, the more how I see how the Afghan war is being, being fought, uh, the more I be believe this is happening. You know, the death and the rape of this young girl, a seven-year-old, Zainab, her body just found on a trash heap, has sparked a whole new level of outrage around the world. Uh, what can you tell us about why the Pakistani police or the regional police, you know, didn't get onto this case as quickly as the parents would have liked, for instance. Uh, Christian, as you know, I mean, um, frankly speaking, in a country like Pakistan, the efficiency and the training and the requirement of the police uh, leaves much to be desired. But uh, one thing that this incident has done in Pakistan is that it has really woken up the conscience of the entire nation, and you say the world is, in, is up in arms, I think much more than the world, Pakistan is currently in a state of mourning on this one incident. And as you know well, having covered, you know, events and wars and incidents all over the world, sometimes it takes one incident to spark the conscience and the awareness that is required on matters which are generally considered to be taboo, because sexual assault on young children is obviously not uh, something which is specific to Pakistan happens all over the world, 
But in Pakistan, because of the cultural inhibitions about speaking about such issues, uh, this particular issue, I think, has just woken up the consciousness of the entire nation. And people are now, for instance, in Sindh, creating entire curriculum, the government, on creating the awareness of sexual assaults and how children can protect themselves and how the society can protect them. Well, well, that's interesting because, uh, in fact, uh, an opinion writer on CNN wrote the following, that there is no such thing as sex education in Pakistan, let alone childhood sexual abuse prevention education. Children never learn how to protect themselves from pedophiles, etc. Teaching a child about what sorts of behavior an adult or older child must never inflict is believed to be the same as teaching an innocent child about having sex. And therein lies part of the problem, right? Absolutely, uh, Christian. I think like many other things uh, that Pakistan is trying to correct right now, uh, this very sad incident uh, has is literally breaking the taboo as we speak. It's not just this one event. This is now brought to light many, many uh, child abuse, child sexual pred uh, predators and murder. And still, you know, it was the parents and the family who identified the CCTV footage that showed this poor little Zainab walking away with a, a, an older man. It wasn't the police. And they say, you know, the police should have been able to do that and perhaps the guy would have been arrested. I think um, a lot of the footage obviously came from a general uh, response that we have all over Pakistan now to try and take care of crime, uh, which has to do with the safe city projects, uh, which has to do with CCTV footage of streets, uh, bazaars, markets, etc. So that is uh, in some ways a step forward that has been taken, which allowed for you know this type of footage to appear in the first place. But uh, I, I don't think I disagree with you, and I think none, nobody in Pakistan, frankly speaking, disagrees with you, either at the political level or at the social level, that much, much, much more needs to be done to ensure that our children are safe. And now people are suddenly realizing that protection of children will have to break those cultural taboos. So I'm quite hopeful that this particular incident, you know, for instance, Malala's incident woke up the nation to a different type of a challenge. And I think this incident has woken up people to a very clear social danger, which is certainly not only present in Pakistan, it's present all over the world. But in Pakistan, I think people are now demanding that governments, whether they're at the provincial level or at the federal level, do much more at every level to, uh, to, to basically uh, face this issue, uh, you know, very, very aggressively. Now, you mentioned Malala. Of course, she was the little Pakistani girl who was shot in the head for just wanting to go to school. And she has since created a movement. She's won a Nobel Prize. I think the whole world perhaps knows Malala. Um, you have daughters. You're the mother of daughters. Do you think your country is safe for your daughters? You know, Christian, mashallah, my children go to school in this uh, country. I have no other nationality. I intend to live in this country. I intend my children to grow in this country. And I can tell you, uh, even though uh, we are all obviously, uh, I think post 9-11, Pakistan went through um, the worst possible effects of terrorist, terrorism uh, permeating through the Afghan borders into the Pakistani territory. Um, and uh, we went through many, many bomb attacks and many, many um, strikes of all sorts. But I can tell you, I think Pakistan currently is living the fruits of its older reputation. And Pakistan in the last 10 years has, is a country which is an active war. Our soldiers are dying on a daily basis to try and get this country back to normal. And uh, the uh, violence has decreased uh, pretty much in all parts of the country. Uh, our territory, large scales of this territory, is now back under the control of the government. So I believe that our direction is right. On that note, former Foreign Minister Ina Rabanika, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you.